Good morning, Stottendam. Nice to see you. Hope you're having a wonderful cruise. This is one of the best I've ever had. Terry Davies, are you here? There you go. I, I have, uh, Terry caught me last night at 8 o'clock and gave me a great honor and sang the Rocket Man song, Elton John. So I am the Abba, Fob, and Terry Davis honorary Rocket Man. One other uh, brief thing. Your last name is Davies, yeah. correct? Very Welsh. Yeah. My maternal great-grandmother, Clara Davis. So we're kin. Yeah. yeah. I've often gotten the question, why should we spend that money in space? Why don't we spend that on education? It's an excellent question, a good question. And I've tried to answer it, but this is a really important lecture for me because I need your feedback to find out whether I have answered it. And the way I have answered it, there are four or five answers, uh, good answers in my opinion. I want to make sure I didn't miss any that were important to you. So please, after you hear this, grab me, uh, say, uh, I didn't think about that, or Frank, you didn't think about this, so let's launch off on it and see if we can learn together, and that uh, actually is the point. I'm going to give you several indirect, uh, maybe appeal to your emotions a little bit rather than your technical, uh, our toys that come from space program. First one that I think of why we explore is, I honestly believe it is a fundamental part of our DNA, our human species. Uh, it is curiosity. It's survival. Uh, it is uh, exploration is in our soul. This chart represents uh, where we think how we have always gone to new places. You know, the bear went over the hill to see what was over the hill. And that led us to expand from where we think was Central Africa, tropical areas, all the way through here. The Indonesians went without GPS, without compasses, looking at the stars and the waves and the seaweed and things like that, and consistently migrated thousands of miles over open sea to go to places like Hawaii and Tahiti, etc. Over to North America, South America, the truth is we have explored our entire planet. Another reason to expand our civilization, culture, trade, and wealth. And you'll notice that there was a huge trade between Europe off into China, a land trade system, because we went to China to find things like silk, uh, bring those back to Europe. We would go to India to find tea. Uh, and we also had sea routes throughout the, the Indian Ocean and Java, the Ch Silk Road, Marco Polo, the travels of Marco Polo. That was all about trade, to bring different uh, products from different parts of the world and to trade them. The Vikings, for example, were great traders. There was a bit of uh, raping, plundering, and pillaging apparently in their history, but uh, uh, I think they're civilized now. We have the Holland America Voyage of the Vikings, so I th it's probably safe to go see the Vikings now. Interestingly enough, in the uh, 11, 12, uh, 1400s, Islam conquered most of this area and closed the route after they uh, took the fall of Constantinople right here at the opening of the Black Sea, now called Istanbul or uh, Constantinople, was the major land route across Asia. When uh, Constantinople fell in 1453, that route was closed, and the reason Columbus went west he was looking for a, another sea trade route to the Far East to replace this trade that was not happening because the land route was closed, interestingly enough. So it wasn't just exploration. It was about expanding our trade and our wealth and our culture. Chinese were great explorers, 1405 to 1433 were the voyages of Admiral Zheng He, and he explored throughout China, all the way down here into Indonesia, the Malaysian Peninsula, India, uh, all we have clear evidence 
that they went through the Persian Gulf and along the coast of Africa. There have been recent studies that now suggest that Admiral Zheng He and his fleet actually circumnavigated the globe around 1420 to 1425, well before Magellan and well before Columbus discovered the Americas. We think that they discovered Australia, Cape Horn, South America, up the west coast of South America, including uh, California. Part of the reason, that there's a great book, I read it two or three cruises ago called 1421, highly recommend it, and he gives a compelling story of Admiral Zheng He and their ships doing a very large exploration uh, throughout the world. Interestingly enough, look at the size of Admiral Zheng He's ships versus Vasco da Gama's ship. 74 foot long versus 400. These were huge, huge ocean sailing ships. He had a fleet of over 300. Here's a model of one of Admiral Zheng He's flagships. Uh, let me say one more thing about Admiral Zheng He, and I may come back to this a little bit later in terms of implications of not exploring, of not following. When he came back uh, in, in 1433, there was a new emperor of China. That emperor turned inward, and he decided that it was not proper for the Chinese culture to go expand out into the rest of the world, and when Admiral Zheng He came back, he was ordered to burn all 300 of his exploration ships, the largest that, that, we, that we have ever seen in this time frame, extraordinarily large versus what the Europeans had. And China turned inward and stopped exploring. And then we, you know, it was a thousand years before China then be began to uh, reach out. So uh, when we turn inward, there are unintended consequences and implications for not trying to drive forward. Here's another uh, reason that I think that it's important that we explore new opportunities, status and reward, economic growth. Here's Cantino's world map in 1502, and notice how our maps, anyone who uh, heard uh, Daniel's talk on navigation, a great, a great talk, talked about how we went over these large distances. And Canoe's uh, 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 talk about uh, uh, James Cook. James Cook was a scientist, an explorer. The British paid and sent him out. They used their tax dollars, if you will to send James Cook out to do scientific, to make maps, and he was an extraordinary map maker and a navigator. Look how the maps have discovered the west coast of uh, North America, the Caribbean, Greenland, things that you recognize. We have a very good picture of Africa, the Middle East, Indonesia, here's India. Uh, and so these were basically driven by Columbus's voyage to the Caribbean, Cabral, uh, Spanish to Brazil, Vasco da Gama, sorry, Cabral was Portuguese. Brazil still speaks Portuguese because the Portuguese were the major explorers of South America on the East Coast, Spanish on the West Coast. Uh, Cortez, Vasco da Gama, etc., uh, built these maps and increased our knowledge. The Age of Discovery, 1418 through the 1500s, and here are some different voyages. The Portuguese possessions, notice how they are in uh, the Brazil. The Portuguese went around Africa, all the way over into Indonesia, including uh, Japan, the Philippines. They landed in Japan in 1542, and these were the major areas. Uh, there was a, a treaty of Torda, Tordesilas in 1494, uh, that separated these areas to the east belonged to Portugal, these to the west belonged to Spain, because Portugal and Spain were fighting and debating over, over these riches. So part of that was this f a famous treaty that divided the world into two pieces. So uh, Portugal was a major explorer. I'll come back to that in a few moments. What's another reason? The challenge to understand the unknown, to boldly go where no one has gone before. 
I had someone come up to me uh, while we were looking at the stars and ask me a question, said, okay, Frank, where is Vulcan? And I went, I don't know, but I know it's out there, and I know it's in our, so, uh, in our Milky Way. I just love that question, where's Vulcan? I'm a full-blown full blown Trekkie. Uh, here are some examples of this, the challenge, to go where no one has gone before. There's a big list of them. These are just three of my favorites. Charles Lindbergh, first solo across the Atlantic, May 20th through 21st on 1927. What happened when Charles Lindbergh landed in Paris at Le Bourget Airport? Anybody know? He was surrounded by this crowd of screaming people who knew he was coming, and when he made it successfully, there was a tremendous outpouring of yay, you know, and clapping and all that. Um, Hillary and uh, Norgay summited Mount Everest, May 29th, 1953. First time to climb Mount Everest. Now it's a tourist zone. But uh, okay, it's a very dangerous tourist uh, zone, lest you forget. Uh, when you get above 20,000 feet, it's called the zone of death. And to this day, there are a significant number of climbers of Mount Everest, even though there's a whole like wagon train going up there in the summer every day. It's a very dangerous climb. K2, another mountain in the Himalayas, even more dangerous, has claimed over 30 or 40 percent of the people that try to climb K2 are, are killed. Yuri Gagarin, uh, first human space flight, April 1961. So uh, if you're taking notes, that's about four or five, six things. The challenge, to go where no one has gone before. What else? Drive technology development to establish world leadership and economic growth to enhance national security. I'm a great fan of Teddy Roosevelt, and I love this, and, I, and it speaks uh, strongly to me. I was a military helicopter pilot for five years. Walk softly, speak softly, but carry a big stick, just in case. But we went to the moon in 1969 uh, to drive our technology, to challenge America, to, to become a leader in space exploration, and we did that successfully. The other thing that I admire from uh, President John Kennedy was this challenge that drove our technological leadership was not a military challenge. Think about that. Uh, we were concerned the space race, the roots of the space race, came because the Russians had larger, more powerful rockets, and we feared them. If you could put a Sputnik in orbit, you could also send a thermonuclear weapon to America over the pole with rockets this large. Our rockets and our engines weren't as powerful. So the genesis of the space race was fear of a weapon John Kennedy turned that around instead of an arms race, said, we choose to lead the space exploration, and he did it with a non-military uh, symbol of driving our technology force, a gifted uh, example of leadership, I believe. And so, on our lander at the Apollo 11 site, Tranquility Base, uh, we left a plaque on the side for any future uh, salvage expert that says, we came in peace for all mankind. And who can uh, forget the world's celebration of America's triumphant landing on the moon? Here are the Apollo 11 astronauts' families, Neil Armstrong and his family together in their home when we successfully landed on the moon. Of course, mission control goes wild, and rightfully so. And sure enough, just like Charles Lindbergh, who landed in Paris, the Apollo 11 a astronauts went to New York. And I'm glad I wasn't part of the cleanup crew for this uh, ticker tape parade. But what a, what a terrific and remarkable achievement. Do you remember that? Did you feel a sense of pride and, uh, and excitement that America had accomplished this incredible feat? Uh, that is, that's an important reason to explore. Now I'm, I'm going to switch from kind of your, um, uh, my emotional appeal and maybe this kind of touchy-feely of, you know, it drives your technology and blah, blah, blah. Let's go talk about direct benefits of how space has uh, helped you. Right now we have instant worldwide communications. Thankfully, my uh, dear eight-year-old uh, granddaughter, Abigail Elizabeth, taught me how to use this thing. You know what this thing is? 
instant worldwide communications. And it does amazing things. If you stop and think about this, uh, we have one of the drivers of the space industry that you may not be aware of is uh, larger computers, more computing power in a smaller pay space. The ability to have generate more power and communications with smaller boxes, electricity. So this constant drive to minimize things, make them smaller, make them more efficient comes from the space program and here's why. To send one pound into Earth orbit takes 28 pounds of rocket and fuel. To send one pound to the moon or Mars takes 40 pounds of rocket and fuel. So you can see the leverage, the incredible payoff of even reducing the weight 10%. And we went from vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits. This probably would have happened anyway because it is so valuable to society. But the imperative of reducing the weight and power in the space program was a major driver to that technology advance, and we all benefit from it right now. I can pick this phone up anywhere I want, and if I pay the right amount, and I call them first. And three of my grandparents are Scott, a bit of German and Wales, Terry. Uh, uh, so I'm cheap. My sister is a little kinder. She says, no, Tom, you're frugal. <laughs> so now nah, I'm cheap. Instant worldwide communications. We have worldwide tev television. Weather forecasting, we will never be surprised on the Gulf Coast where I lived for over 30 some years of a hurricane coming into Galveston unknown to us and in, the, in uh, 1900 killed 2,000 people on the island of Galveston, a Katrina type hurricane in 2000. We will never be surprised. Now you may choose to stay, that's your choice, but uh, I would advise against it, by the way, having gone through two Category 3 hurricanes. If it's me, just leave, please. But you will know it's coming because of the advantages of the space age. GPS navigation, uh, our fine Captain uh, Vincent uh, took me upstairs and showed me some of their uh, navigational equipment. To his credit, he also showed me a program on his computer that he built that he takes the star sightings at the stars that we were looking at, if you were able to join me above the crow's nest, puts that information in, and our good captain can still navigate just in case those GPS satellites go a silent. And I, I'm thankful for that. He's a, quite a gifted man. Earth resources, monitoring, crop forecasts, transportation tracking, uh, most uh, trucks, trains, every ship that you see, there's a website on the internet that you can go type in the ship's name and it will show you exactly where on the planet it is. And I actually used that on one of these trips when I was supposed to meet the Holland America ship in Honolulu. So in LA, I typed into that website on this clever little device that my granddaughter taught me how to use. And sure enough, it told me where the Staten Dam was and where, where, where it was going, where it would be birthed. Military surveillance, astronomy, and cosmology. These are all direct uh, benefits of space exploration. Here's some pictures. Now, I, I found that it's important to not just have a bunch of words. We're very visual people, so here's some photographs. This is what a communication satellite looks like. If you were here, I talked about why are they at 22,500 miles and why are they at the equator, and the answer is the rotation rate exactly matches the rotation rate of the Earth. Therefore, I don't have to have complicated tracking mechanisms. So for me to get direct TV and watch Texas A&M University play Alabama, I have this big dish up on my uh, roof, and when they came out and installed it, they got the maximum signal, bolted it down, and it has not moved since. And that's why those communication satellites are in this important, uh, what do we say, park place, and what's the other one in Monopoly? Boardwalk. Boardwalk. That's part of space at 22,500 miles is Park Place and Boardwalk real estate. And it's getting pretty crowded because there's so many satellites up there. So now we're talking about when your satellite's done, we want you to move it so that we can park something else there and use it. 
weather satellites, t uh, many of them are go in the polar direction so that the Earth turns under it and we can see even the poles. Some are in geostationary. GPS is a constellation of 24 satellites and our GPS receivers in our, now in our phones and it used to be a box nearly as big as this lecture stand. They take timed signals from three different satellites. We know the speed of light. We can get their, their uh, distance from us and then we can do that spherical geometry and tell our position on Earth extremely accurately. We can send probes. We have Curiosity driving around on Mars looking for water and looking for life. And uh, I've, that's pretty remarkable stuff. Other direct benefits, it's a technology driver. Our computers, smaller, faster, more memory, lower power. This little device right here has a billion times more memory than the computer that we use to land on the moon. The computer we used to land on the moon was the size of a bread box and had 16K, that's 16,000 words of memory. I have a little memory stick that plugs in the side of this thing to put photos on. It has 32 gig. You know, that's billions of times more memory in three or four decades. Green energy, data compression, materials research. We're now using materials in modern airplanes that are not aluminum, but they come from the space program, uh, Kevlar, uh, carbon fi fabrics, uh, uh, things like that that have reduced the weight, made airplanes more efficiently because of this leverage that I talked about that you can have less rockets to put more payload into orbit. Medical monitoring and diagnostics, ma MRIs, magnetic resonance, uh, what's the I stand for? Imaging. Imaging, thank you. CAT scans, heart monitors, power and propulsion, water purification, aerodynamics and structures. All of these things come directly from driving to do things that no one has done before. Economic growth, technology spin-off, new industries. Here, uh, there have been several studies. This number varies, but I challenge you to find another taxpayer-spent uh, endeavor by the government that has paid off more handsomely than space exploration. One dollar spent on space exploration has generated eight dollars in growth in manufacturing, medicine research, education, transportation infrastructure. I have these from several studies. They're not just the space industry touting their own home, but that number has varied from eight to fifteen dollars for everyone invested. All I'm telling you is name me another government investment that has generated that type of return. Peace through strength, surveillance, command, control, communication, smart weapons, intelligent robotic systems, overwhelming superiority and power projection, and that comes back to Teddy Roosevelt saying, walk softly but carry a big stick so that if someone does think about attacking you, they're thinking about that big stick. Doesn't mean you're the bully, but it also means you're not the wimp the 90-pound weakling on the beach that someone might try to take advantage of you. Here are some examples. The iPhone, laptops. We are using laptops on the space station. We have seven or eight. Or, we know, actually, we had about 20 the last time. You use them for a lot of different resources. CAT scan. Many of us are now have lithium uh, ion batteries, extremely high density, much, much more power density, or I can pack more power into this package than the lead acid batteries that we use to start our automobiles and that we've used for, for uh, uh, se uh, several generations or uh, centuries. Uh, new jet engines, notice this funny scalloped edge back here. That comes from noise reduction technology and it's actually aerodynamics. It's trying to create a tight cone that keeps this high velocity gas from coming and bubbling and making a lot of noise. So you will notice that modern jet aircraft are not only more efficient, but they're a lot quieter from uh, some of this research. Medical monitoring, uh, Dr. DeBakey, uh, uh, the great heart surgeon down in the Houston area. We can put devices in here to stabilize you, maybe until you can get heart transplant, monitor them. Uh, we're now doing tremendous work in s robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery. The smaller incision you can make, the less 
the recovery time, the less damage we've done to go get in there and poke around. Uh, the Da Vinci robotic assisted surgical systems are making remarkable developments. Um, a lot, most of this robotic technology services smarts the actual mechanics. Some of that comes from Canada, the Canada arm to our Canadian friends who are on board. A lot of it comes from Japanese research, but we're now using it even for surgery and surgery by the surgeon being remote halfway around the world with this worldwide telecommunications. He's not even in the operating room, but he's in a place where he can manipulate these things to remote areas. Remarkable stuff. We have developed water purification and recycling. Somebody told me, asked me uh, earlier, what do we do with the human waste on the space station? It's a good question. The answer is we take the urine and the, even the perspiration from your body. We have learned how to purify it and recycle it. And we take those, that waste liquid and turn it back into drinkable water. I almost wish I didn't know that, you know. <laughs> if you're aboard the space station and you're going, oh no, what am I drinking now, right? We have water purification that we have shared NASA technology with to companies that are now providing a, a clean water to uh, families in India that, have, that were killing, were stopping things like cholera and waterborne diseases in remote areas where they just don't have clean water. And these are, uh, can help a family, even an individual home or a, or a village. We are analyzing uh, greenhouse gases, air, water pollutants, critical physiological data. This used to be taped stuff all over you. The astronauts hated it. It just annoyed them. They, one, they didn't like doctors because if the doctor saw something in a measurement, he could ground you. And any of you pilots know that doctors grounding you is not what you want to happen. So there was this, always this uh, head butting between the astronauts and the medical community, but we have reduced all of that to something that might fit in your pocket, give blood, pulse rate, etc. We're using it in hospitals. When you go to the ER now, they put something on your finger that can measure without stabbing you with needles the oxygen content of your blood. It can tell what your pulse is, what your respiration, stuff like that. All came from the space program. Ion thrusters, uh, we, uh, these are uh, eight to ten times more efficient than chemical propulsion. These are the type of things that we need to keep satellites in orbit and to change orbits and to develop a transportation system between the space station and the moon because they are much more efficient. They only generate low thrust. So we can't use them to lift off the Earth. That's why we need this technology used as a space transportation, always based in space, doesn't come back to the Earth, much, much more efficient. You have engines that have high strength aluminum alloys that came directly from Marshall Space Flight Center developed aluminums in these fans that clear exhaust gases from tunnels, much lighter, much safer. I'm going to flip through these quickly. There are, uh, we test cultures in space. We use microgravity to grow sp some specific things in the yellow or some of the keys, a bit too wordy of a chart. But my point here is that NASA has tried to partner with industry to take things that we have developed in space and now let American industry apply them to useful products and services on Earth. We do uh, environmental change, and uh, who's getting water, who's getting rain, who isn't, what, what's a threat um, to uh, uh, crop growth, things like that. Try to plan ahead for that. Uh, we are doing uh, green energy, solar energy uh, research. We have developed coatings that make the cells more efficient and also help them clean themselves. If you're out in the desert and you have this big solar energy, solar array, or it's up on your house and it gets dirty, it loses a significant efficiency. So these resulting cells are much higher performance over and more durable over longer periods of time. We have some fire hoses that are 80% faster than a traditional fire hose and only use 6% as much water to put out a fire. And that came from hybrid rocket engine technology and the computer programs that we use to understand the flow in a rocket engine 
applied to a nozzle like this that makes them significantly more uh, effective. Landsat data. We're constantly looking at, uh, at different areas of crops, forest, make sure that we're properly use, utilizing our resources. We don't want to turn Brazil into a desert because we're taking all of their hardwood out. It is our responsibility to be the husbands or the keepers of a good planetary environment. Clean air, clean water, those are a absolutely important things. Sounds like I'm a tree hugger, I am. Here's a hurricane watch. Here's a, a hurricane. I think this may even have been a picture of Katrina before it headed for New Orleans. But we, we are using this information to plan forward for emergency reaction teams to try to get people out of the way of these huge and dangerous and powerful storms. Uh, we're also making the space station available to even students and researchers. This is a company that I've worked with a little bit called NanoRacks. There they are, NanoRacks.com. For, for you web surfers, that's a good place to go. And they help uh, make small satellites and ordinary students and projects in partnership with NASA, who doesn't charge them the $10,000 a pound that it takes to get one pound of stuff up to the space station to do new research and to encourage our, uh, the education and science programs in our schools. Here are some of the things they're doing uh, by high school students in Silicon Valley, uh, new computers flown in space, how do they react to the zero gravity environment? What does the radiation environment do to them? First iPhone in space uh, used, we actually took it up there and we, and we were able to talk to some students on the ground. Tur Turpin's Whiskey did an experiment. I, I want to read this story. I want to hear which of the Russians and which of the Americans tasted of this beverage in uh, zero gravity. And uh, we, we have done uh, different nano labs or aboard the space shuttle uh, using parts of uh, our experimental racks in the three laboratories. Let's talk about now, we, we talked about uh, emotional stuff and some direct benefits. Let's talk some indirect benefits. We inspire the next generation. We need to be leaders in science, math, and technology in order for our culture to continue to advance. It attracts our best and brightest at the cutting edge of new technology. We're going where no one has gone before, and we're trying to do it for the benefit of all. And that's why NASA does this in the open versus the early Russian space program where everything was secret. So we want people to, uh, who, who want to go where no one else has go, Trekkies and chemists and physicists and engineers and people who build models and stuff to come and help us uh, go further. A better world for our children, a continued belief in American excellence, respect for ourselves, understanding and solving our environmental issues, uh, building trust and cooperation among the nations. The space station is a magnificent example of that. And it was a great honor and privilege for me to try to lead the engineering teams, keep them in the same room, and not let their arrogance get in the way of our success. That was the hardest thing I, did to, I had to do. It wasn't about uh, my knowledge or my engineering skills. It was, I, I had a couple of examples where we had a fire on the Mir space station from one of their devices that generates oxygen from an endothermic reaction. That means it's not supposed to burn. It's supposed to heat up and give off oxygen, but there was a piece of debris in it and that oxygen environment and that heat caused that little piece of rubber glove that was part of the assembly process to catch on fire. And now this thing filled the whole Mir space station with smoke. I built a team of, uh, from four different centers, people that had knowledge about combustion and zero gravity from uh, Cleveland and the Lewis Research Center, Langley Research Center. We went to Russia, and in about the first 30 minutes of our uh, meeting with the Russians, our American engineers were in their finger pointing arrogance mode, how did you do this, why did you let this happen, etc. And I had to counsel in public with the trans Russian translator, our team, and I tried to do it in a gentle but firm way. 
that we were going to work in a partnership to solve what, why this happened and how we could prevent it from happening again and get off of your high horse pointing fingers at our Russian colleagues. And, and that calmed it down. Everybody got the message and we went about our business and we actually found the problem. We reproduced it in a ground test and that changed the Russian method of how they put this device together to try to prevent a future fire. Um, and hopefully learning to live and work in space, which is the next frontier and will be for generations to come, the ability to colonize our solar system, perhaps avoid the fate of the dinosaurs. Do you know what happened to the dinosaurs? 65 million years ago, a Mount Everest-sized rock hit off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and, and smashed our environment so that large plants died and large animals who ate the large plants died. And there's this layer called the KT layer that's all the way around the Earth. Below this layer, thin layer, is dinosaurs and dinosaur bones. Above this layer, no dinosaurs, no dinosaur bones. And a specific isotope of, of uh, iridium unique to asteroids is in that layer and as we got closer to the Yucatan Peninsula, it's worldwide by the way, it was that big a catastrophe. As we got closer to the Yucatan Peninsula, the concentration of that unique iridium as, uh, isotope is greater and all of that was a great detective story and so the dinosaurs were wiped out by a major change to the, uh, to the environment. Let's talk a little bit about balancing our expenditures. How many of you would say that I spend 50% on space, 10% on space, 1% on space? 50%, raise your hand, of our, our national budget. Uh, how about 10%, raise your hand, okay? 1%, we actually are spending right now, I think about half of a percent, a half a penny on uh, space research, on NASA, of our federal budget. All of these things are important. I am not going to argue that we shouldn't be doing this. Social Security, 34, Medicare and Health, uh, and 24, military, 18, interest on the debt, 17 percent, etc. NASA's half a penny of your federal tax dollar comes out of this budget, veterans benefits, so it is a very tiny amount. The question we should ask ourselves is, do we have the proper balance? Are we encouraging our culture to, to do better? Are we getting a return? Or are we flushing money down the toilet? Uh, I'm sure all of us will have a different answer, but you need to talk to your congressman about your views of are we properly spending that? Is it the right balance? I'm not debating that the government doesn't need to do these things, but I'm wondering if we have uh, a good and healthy for our future generations balance. Here's an interesting plot that shows percent of gross domestic product, GDP, percent of budget. Here's John Glenn. Here's the years. Here's the percent. percent. Notice the peak during the moon race spending was before we landed on the moon, but it was about 5% of our federal budget. That is a very large percentage versus the half a percent we're spending now, and that's this line down here. Shuttle starts, shuttle first flight, space station first flight, continuing to decline. What does history says happens to cultures that abandon exploration as a national priority? China burned Admiral Zheng He's fleet in the 1430s, and China turned inward for centuries. Portugal turns away from exploiting their technological uh, advances under Henry the Navigator, and they ceded leadership within 100 to 150 years to the Spanish, the French, the English, and the Dutch. America retires the space shuttle without an American replacement to carry U.S. astronauts to space. We now spend $70 million for every seat on a Soyuz rocket to take American astronauts to the International Space Station that we paid for about 70% of. When I left NASA, we still had the space shuttle 
but we were paying $35 million a seat to come home on the Soyuz. Now that they are the monopoly and only game in town, it recently went to 70 million, and I guarantee you, we have taught the Russians something about capitalism since the middle 1990s. If they're the only game in town, that price is going this way, right? Not this way. So uh, I leave it to you, an exercise to the reader, now that I've done my lawyer thing, which is hard for me, an engineer, and tried to lead the witness on what does history say happens to cultures that abandon exploration as a national priority. Final thoughts. America as we know it would not exist without the exploration drive of our European ancestors. Second thing is most people are unaware of some of the things that I've talked to you about uh, that are amazing, the number of spin-off technologies, and you can find many examples of them in this website, spinoff.nasa.gov. One dollar of space exploration has generated at least eight dollars of economic growth. Positive outcome, not negative outcome that's not generating any, any new uh, uh, growth for us. Few other national investments have paid off so well, and there are many more examples here on spinoff.nasa.gov. Here's my bottom line, back to the visual thing. We Notice this is both North America and Canada, and I really should have another slide that has all of South America with it. We would not be in America without our European ancestors. Imperative to uh, explore. Here's a composite picture at night where, where we had different pieces and could take out the clouds of what does America look like now. 1600, 1620, a couple of campfires right here, correct? Jamestown, and look where we've come. So that's my attempt to answer why should we support space exploration and what has it done for you. I have a couple of minutes for questions, if you like. Right here in the front. Ah, yes, I'm sorry, I went... I went off on a tangent, didn't I? Well, I didn't answer the question of what do we do with the waste. We turn the liquid waste back into drinkable water. The solid waste, we have a centrifuge in our fancy toilet. And so after they're finished, they close the lid. That's good. We spin up the centrifuge, and it takes the liquids out and compacts it. And then we put it in a biologically uh, per friendly and protective bag. And then we put it in a place, it's essentially freeze dried. And then what we do is we put it in the Progress or the Japanese cargo vehicle or the uh, SpaceX vehicle that brings up cargo because when they're finished, we release them and they come back and do a c controlled reentry. The SpaceX actually lands so it can bring back cargo, but the other three vehicles burn up in the atmosphere and so we turn them into uh, solid waste electrons and protons as we burn them up in the atmosphere. Thank you. I'm glad I did forget that. Sorry. Question right here. What's your opinion of what's going to happen to our What's my opinion of what's going to happen to our space program? Wow. Uh, maybe I should have a lecture on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, let me turn this around, if I may. What's your opinion of what will happen to the American space program? Scares you. Scares you. Anybody else? What's your opinion of what will happen to the American space program? I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, so if you don't feel comfortable answering, okay. Come down to a small program. Um, the real answer is hard to say because I, I think uh, space, spending money on space is not a political issue. When you ask people what are your political concerns that you might go talk to your representative about, space doesn't show up even in the top 40. So we are not something that our representatives and senators are too worried about. Uh, so my conclusion from that is it takes extraordinary leadership, probably at the executive level, in order to challenge us 
to uh, go pay attention to this and, and do something about it. The second thing I've observed about uh, human nature is it usually takes surprises for us to react to things and to actually do something about it. I'll give you a good example. Pearl Harbor, okay? Uh, Sputnik. Most of you were alive during Sputnik. Do you remember what that was about? It generated, we are behind. They are ahead. That is the Cold War enemy. They have big rockets that can lob nasty things on us. And so that surprise uh, helped us go from our status quo and you know, we're happy and, and uh, do something about it and apply resources. I wish I could answer the question. It's a great question, but it's one that you should ask yourself. Uh, but I think it will probably take another surprise and it will probably take extraordinary le leadership like John Kennedy had. Now, John Kennedy also was reacting to this Sputnik launch, okay? So, you know, we might have a president who says, let's go back to the moon. George W. Bush uh, tried to put that in place. And then we get a new administration, and they would like to go do something else. No, let's not do that. Let's go capture an asteroid. And then we might get a new one. So if you think about this, it took 300 years for humans to, for people in northern Italy, in Milano, to build the great and incredible cathedral in Milan. 300 years. Think how many generations that is. We have about a four-year attention span, if that. So, it's a good question. Right, right here. Okay, the question is, we've spent all of this money and, and, and the government has on developing these technologies. Why can't private industry step forward and do that? It's a good question. And part of that is, what is the relationship between government and industry? I would give you a couple of examples in a second. There is a relationship. If we go back and look at a successful transportation revolutions, Roman roads, Erie Canal, Transcontinental Railroad, Interstate Highways, the commercial aviation industry and its growth during the 30s. What we found were several key principles. Uh, one of those is the government does the technology and the research and then openly shares that with private industry. Second thing is the government tries to encourage what can be risky and difficult investments. Transcontinental Railroad, we, we guaranteed their bonds because it was a huge cost to build these railroads before they started generating money in a long time. We gave them land along the, the railroad. Erie Canal, we charged them tariffs uh, so that it could pay for itself, even though uh, 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 Clinton was the governor of New York. They called it Clinton's Ditch. And they, he was chided because, it, you know, this is a crazy idea. Why are you doing this? And yet it opened up the Great Lakes and made Chicago a great city because they could get the Midwestern products by water to uh, New York Harbor. And it also made uh, New York Harbor the number one harbor instead of Philadelphia and Baltimore. So there, there's a balance. The government should be involved in safety. Now let me focus real quickly on, on, on space. The government should stop building and operating rockets to low Earth orbit, and they should encourage the private industry to do that, and we are doing that not fast enough or at the right balance of funding, in my humble opinion, but what do I know? I'm a retired rocket scientist. So that I hope that answered your question. Right here. The question is, do we have the technology to go to the moon and beyond, or are we leaping to a bridge too far, if I may use that metaphor, being a World War II history student? Uh, that's Operation Market Garden, by the way, uh, when the Brits jumped in and tried to take the Arnhem Bridge, a bridge too far. Do we have the technology to get there? Yes. Do we have the technology to sustain a, an outpost, a Jamestown, if you will, on the moon? No. There are two reasons. 
We don't have the most efficient transportation uh, area. We are not thinking about using the space station as a transportation node like St. Louis to go to California and then to the moon so that we can have this space-based only going back and forth. I don't want to take a rocket from the surface of the moon for every uh, M&M that I send up to the moon. The third thing is we need to learn how to use solar energy nuclear power to convert the resources living off the land that are on the moon into usable things concrete for structure water rocket fuel to leave the moon put giant uh, electromagnetic rail guns that can take stuff from the moon and put it into orbit then this transportation now, so i hope i've I've uh, tried to answer your question. So those are the things that NASA should be doing, not building rockets. Let our industry do that. Just like the government started building airplanes, but they let private industry build the, the great airline system and structure. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing you around the ship. Always available for uh, questions. Love your questions. I learn more from you probably than you learn from me. And tomorrow we're going to talk about is Mars the next destination for your human exploration. And how do we get to Mars? How, how hard is that? So hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.